Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're about a minute early, but I'm going to go ahead and get started because we've got a lot tonight. I'm going to end actually just a few minutes before 7 because I need the nominating committee. And some of you are in here tonight. Some will be coming just for that to meet me in the chapel. We have a 15-minute educational meeting. And then the administrative board is at 715 in here. And you're all welcome. If you're a member of the church, you have voice and vote. If you're not a member of the church, you're still welcome to be here and just to watch us go through the different uh, items. And we've got some very important ones that we'll be lifting up tonight. So good to have you here with us. I'm going to share a couple things, but I want to begin with our Jesus dollars. Hey, Fran takes care of that for us. So if anybody's got a, I went through, I've got about 10 $1 bills and I can't find a Jesus dollar, but I did find a K dollar. King, king, king. I got an L dollar for loser. Anybody got any loser dollars? <laughs> Harry Troop, that'll work. That'll work now. We've had some different folks signing up too. Just a reminder, if you want to take the uh, homeless dinner, you can sign up out there, but we, you need to we, let us give you a call to explain what needs to be done uh, because we changed the menu a little bit. It's always the holy bird, <laughs> but they don't need bread. We found that out. Uh, they get the bread like we do, the bread runs. They get a lot of bread, so uh, there's no reason for us to buy bread and take over there. So we've changed that around. But again, you can sign up out there, and we have a, a young gentleman taking it this week, but nobody has signed up for the next month. So if any of you are interested, you just holler at us, all right? But it's on the Welcome Center. J dollars, J dollars. I've got two up here, Fran. How many you got? Look at there. Look at there. If anybody has a hundred dollar bill, doesn't matter what letters on it, it belongs to the Lord. Belongs to the Lord. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. There you go. Fran, I'm going to just give you the envelope here. You can just put it in the envelope there, if you will, count that up. As Fran's finishing up, I think this, any more of this? Or, I got to tell you, I know I've told you this story before, but my uncle, when he uh, uh, converted over to Catholicism in their church, they take up the offering, many of you know, at least most of it, with the long pole with a little bag down the aisles. And so once he became a member, they wanted him to... Uh, uh, be an usher and he said I don't want to do that and they said yes come on come on come on finally got him to do it so he said he said I, I went down the aisles he said I thought that was pretty cool my uncle Harry you know just sliding it down there and he said and then I got it in front of the man that made me do this he said that I was uncomfortable doing it he said but when it got the bag in front of him he said the man leaned over and went he said, and I thought, well, that's not right. <laughs> he said, so I just left it in front of him for a minute, the bag. He said, the man leaned over again. He went, he said, so you know what I did? He said, I took the pole and went, <laughs> it just puffed him in his chest till he pulled out his wallet and put some money out. <laughs> that's what I think about Fred as she's going around and getting all the money. How many J dollars do we have for the homeless tonight? She didn't take her shoes off before she started counting. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How many you got? 52. Woo! <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, Fran. Oh. Dan, we need her on our finance committee. We've got to do something here. And where's Bob White? We need to put her on there for the uh, next year expansion there. Won't fit on the envelope. Now, we don't have Lloyd here tonight, do we? No. He's still on vacation. Let me fold it in half, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Give it to Dan there. That way it's a very... Dan, you can hold on to it, and then we'll figure out what to do with it here tonight. You can just hold on to it, guy. Dan's our finance chair. Thank you, Fran. Let's thank Fran for doing this for us. She's so much. You, you're so wonderful. Uh, let me just give you a quick update uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer on General Conference. And I've received information from Don Chapman, and Don just is here tonight. And we're so excited that Don's a member of our church. And he's been able to send me some of these feeds and... Um, they are, we have a summary here printed out of all the different items that came up at General Conference. Um, 
But the one that we've been most interested in looking at, of course, was what they would do about sexuality. And nothing really was done. You know, you can't change the rules, uh, as we've emphasized over and over again, because the delegation is strongly foreign compared to the United States of America, and it's very evangelical and orthodox in Africa and Asia. And using Robert's Rules of Order and the idea of simple majority rules is just not going to change. As a matter of fact, it's going to become more and more orthodox as the church grows because, if you remember again, that we can never have more than a thousand delegates. We don't have near a thousand at the different meetings because of travel and so forth, but you can't have more than a thousand. That's set. So the bigger the church grows and it's growing in the evangelical areas, then you have more delegates from those areas and less from the other places. So because they didn't have the time and the effort and the resources and they just don't know what to do, afraid that the church would split, they met with different groups about the idea of a schism, but uh, nothing came forefront that would divide the church. So what they have decided, the bishop uh, that's the leader of all the bishops, they elect him to be the council bishop chair, and uh, he is the one in charge now, and as time goes on, you have the uh, the one that is set to come in to take the lead, which will be Florida's bishop, our bishop, will be taking the lead uh, as we move forward, if I have my uh, information correct. But he lists all the different things, and he stressed that more than anything, we want um, unity. And I wondered if that was the kind of message during the Civil War as well. If you remember, you know, just that one, one group is just unity at all cost. And uh, that's where the bishops are holding on to. We need to have unity. Um, and so, how do you have unity in such a diverse church? He, this is on the next steps. Let me just read it to you. It's just a paragraph. He said, we recommend that the general conference defer all votes on human sexuality and refer this entire subject to a special commission named by the Council of Bishops to develop a complete examination and possible revision of every paragraph in our book of discipline regarding human sexuality. We continue to hear from many people on the debate over sexuality that our current discipline contains language which is contradictory, unnecessarily hurtful, and inadequate for the variety of local, regional, regional, and global context. We, the Council of Bishops, will name such a commission to include persons from every region of our United Methodist Church and will include representation from differing perspectives on the debate. We commit to maintain an ongoing dialogue with this commission as they do their work, including clear objectives and outcomes. Should they complete their work in time for a call general conference, then we will call a two- to three-day gathering before the 2020 general conference. We will consult with uh, GCFA, the general conference regarding the cost, finance, and administration, effective ways to hold that gathering. Now, there's a lot of things in that paragraph, and I just want to comment on a few of those, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer, just praying for the church and what the future may hold. As I mentioned, if you're going to go on vote, and for the first three days of general conference, they debated and debated a number of things, but one of the big debates was, can we go on uh, Christian uh, holy conferencing or, you know, uh, concessions? In other words, not a, a majority rule vote, because majority rule right now in the United Methodist Church is very strong one direction. It, it is. So that's set. That's why I told you that if you are orthodox, that's just, that's just the way it's going to be. But with this comment, um, what they're recommending, because the bishops are commissioned by the discipline to have the oversight and the teaching. They are to be guiding us through any storm or any situation. He said, we recommend that the general conference defer all votes on human sexuality and refer this entire subject to a special commission 
My concern with that is that if something happens now between 2016 and 2020, even in Florida, and let's say that I brought charges against someone, let's just say that happened, I think that our bishop could take that concept because that comes from the chairperson of the council of bishops and say, you know, I'm not sure where we're going. This is in process. I think we need to defer. That's my concern. I, I, in other words, I know the rules are set, but until we work through this, I think we just need to hold, hold out. You remember, right, it, General Conference started that uh, to make a statement, 110 clergy came out, uh, said that they were uh, gay, that they had not professed that before. Now, there's none of them in the state of Florida, um, and each annual conference has to deal with their own clergy. And it'll be interesting to watch what happens with that kind of statement. So that concerns me right there. The second thing that disturbs me is that we will name such a commission to include persons from every region of our United Methodist Church. Um, right now, percentage rules the roost. And percentages, there's a major group from Africa. Um, but if you're going to discuss an issue, you know, on equal terms, then you invite somebody from the West, you invite somebody from the South, and if you were going on percentage like the General Conference does, you'd invite 10 from Africa, but not with this. You'd invite one from Africa. You see what I'm getting at? One here, one, and then you're on equal playing ground. That changes the whole perspective. So there is going to be something like that. You know that that's going to develop. And if they call that conference, um, it costs 3 to $4 million dollars is what the cost is going to be. But they think that they can take away a couple days, they think, from the general conference in 2020 because of the cost of that, so it would equal out. So they, I'm sure that they can make that work, that part. But the actual cost of folks from Asia and Africa, because they're not going to go to Asia and Africa to have this meeting. I, I do, <laughs> they're going to have it here in the United States. That means folks that just spent whatever they had to get to Oregon and gone back home, may in two years be called to come back over to America, and I'm not sure they'll have the resources to do that. You know, and maybe some funds would be provided. I don't know. But that's a concern uh, that I have. And so whatever that commission votes on, that will be presented to the General Conference. So just that's a safety valve. has to go back to the General Conference 2020, no matter what they say. And then the decisions have to be ratified if they're major doctrinal changes, you know, if they were, back to the annual conferences. They have to come back to us, and there has to be a percentage of voters of our conference as well as all the others. But if this is a strong statement from the Council on Bishops, that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna be powerful, you know. Uh, and even though the African delegation may rule against that, that they're trying to find a way forward, like the book that we studied a couple months ago from Adam Hamilton, find out a, a, just a creative way. In other words, it's not working, so we're going to find a creative way to make it work. And, and you know, it's, it's awkward for us in Florida, because for us in Florida, it is working. You know, we're the church. We're following the rules. We're just, you know what I mean? I, and I don't want it to sound too, too easy, black and white. But, but for somebody to come into the house and just say, we've got to fix this, there are those of us that are saying, what needs to be fixed? You know, you see what I'm getting at? What, what do we need to fix? I mean, what you're saying is that we're broken, so we need to come up with a new solution and there is some that are saying, I think the solution we're in right now is fine. I think the Methodist theology, the Methodist doctrine is just fine. So anyway, that's just kind of where that is on that issue. Does anybody have a question on that, Charlie? If you've got to, use the microphone if you don't mind. Okay, it seems to me that some of them in this conference are trying to change the rules to make it easier to change the rules for the, for the homosexuals. Yes. Now, what they're yes. doing is letting a sm very small percentage of the people, yes. because a very small percentage are, are 
participating homosexuals. Right. They want to let a very small uh, percentage of the people rule the church. Yes. And that's wrong. Right. And the Bible tells us what's right. And if the Methodist church can't get it right, right. then maybe they need to d divide the church. I, I understand. I agree, Charlie. And that's, that's the issue. Everything just is continuing to edge around. And I don't know where they're going to be able to move forward. There keeps coming up these different ideas. And, and I'm okay as long as the church holds its standard. I mean, that, that's, you know, and that's, they have to right now, but you can see other new areas like this, just what you're saying, are trying to come to make a difference. Who else has the mic there? Oh, go ahead, Dot. Um, legally, what you said a while ago, that if, if charges were brought now, but legally, that we're still bound by the rules of order right now. Mm-hmm. And I don't see how they can put something on hold. Well, th but they have already. That's where it's causing a civil war within the church. Dot. I mean, legally, no. But we do have a few bishops that have stood the ground, like the New York bishop. He said strongly, do not bring me any of these cases. Don't even bring them to me. So what you need, like, what well, you can't, how can you say that? He can, and he says, I said it. The Bishop Talbert that did a, a, a gay wedding and the, the, he came down to, to uh, uh, West Florida, South Alabama and did it there in that conference, even though that wasn't his jurisdiction, he's retired. The bishop from that area said, please don't do this. And he did it anyway. And so it went back to the Council of Bishops and the, you know, because everybody has to be governed by their group. So the bishops have to work with the bishops. So the Council of Bishops, you know, kind of slapped him and said, you know, just stop, don't do this. He has already, as my understanding, done it again. And, and they're, just, they're just slapping him on the, the hand. They're not, there's no strong uh, movement to stop these things because the Council of Bishops obviously have various opinions, it appears. Uh, it, I mean, I don't know that, but that's what it sounds like because this is the leader of the Council of Bishops that's speaking here. Discipline. Discipline. Yes, yes. But remember is, you know, and I don't know if you remember that the way that it is set, just like our United States government, that when you're going to issue the sentence, when someone is found guilty, it goes back to your annual conference and the executive committee deals out, they elect a subcommittee and they deal out how are we going to punish, if I can use that term, the person that's, in, that's made the mistake. And some of the conferences have just been... You know, some have defrocked. Other conferences have just said, we're going to defrock you and take away your pension for so many days, and then you're reinstated. I mean, they, because the, the law says that the ruling of punishment is up to the, the conference. And, the, and there's nowhere in the discipline does it say that if you do this, you have to be defrocked forever. You see what I mean? So there's a lot of loopholes that, that the, the writers of these, the discipline would never have thought about, you know, just like in our own constitution. Things come up like that wasn't the intent, but they, they maneuver it around, you know, different folks. So, but that's, that, you know, the rules are set and it should not be a problem, but it is. John? The rules are set in the Bible. Why can't yes. we stick with them? Well, that's what Charlie was saying, exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it, the line keeps being pushed. but the, the Why do we let it be pushed? Yeah. We you don't, know, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I, we don't have... Um, Why can't we stick with God's Word? I don't know, John. I don't, I mean, because we have some powerful... We have some powerful evangelicals, powerful leaders. My, the president of my seminary, he was before conference. Now, I didn't hear anything from him at conference, but he was forming a group to split the church. He said, I think we just need an amicable. He said, before it gets real nasty, let's just, let's just deal with this issue. And uh, because, you know, you love people and even people that you disagree with, you love them. So let's figure out a way to amicably work with this. And it's been very, very difficult. You know, just like our country is changing so fast right now, 
You know, most of us are going like this, aren't we? Just like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I, you know, every time you turn on the TV or the computer, oh my, 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 my. And so I, I, I see that coming. I'm surprised it hasn't already. I, I don't know why it hasn't. But we do have the leadership that has that ability. Don? It seems to me that because we live in a democracy and we've adopted the yes. rules and regulations of a democracy, we go with it. Right. I don't know if a theocracy would work, but uh, we have to, we're, we're within the confines of democracy, so work it out. Yes, yes, and that is the way it is. It, it, actually, it follows suit. And these commissions can be set, just like the General Council on Bishops will be meeting to decide on this area. Uh, but again, that is just their recommendation. As I said earlier, that's got to go to the 2020 uh, ruling general conference. That's the next general conference every four years, and they have to decide. And they may very well just tell the bishops, we, we're not going with that. And I'm, actually, that's what they're going to say, because it's going to be run by the African embassy. <laughs> it really is. I, I mean, you know, that, that's, so it's just like we're prolonging the agony here. Um, but that's just where it is right now. I don't know what will develop in the next months or if there's going to be more coming out. Don, have you heard anything more? I'm just going on what you've sent me. Anything else? Where's Don? I saw you come in. There you are. Anything else? Yeah, hold on, Don, and then we'll go to Jim back there. Let me get Don and then Jim. One of the things I think that is a concern is that some of these countries that are uh, like in Africa, their government does not permit homosexuality. So right. they, there is an issue that they're dealing with that they're fighting for themselves within those countries where in our country it's now legal. Right, exactly. So we are being pressured by the culture. Of itself, exactly. Not by the church itself. Exactly. And see, that's where the bishops are going to come from, I'm sure, with what, I've, what you've sent me and I've read, is that if you can give it to Jim back there. Uh, Jim, raise your hand again. Hold up just one second when you have it. The idea is that our country has made it legal, and they have not. So the bishops can say, well, we will love our African brothers but we, and sisters, but, and so we want to separate. We want to say this will be legal here, not legal there. Just keep the church unified. I can just see that coming. In other words, trying to say let's keep it in unity. And the reason that they're holding to that is because their country is there. But they're holding to that not because of their country. They're holding to that because of the Bible. You know? Jim? Well, what I understand from the Bible, it says one man, one woman. Yes, sir. And that's what it says. Right. And now we've got people from other countries coming here, and they want to change the Bible. That's not supposed to be. Right, right. I mean, they want to change the dollar bill and take off God we trust. Well, we all know, most of the older people know when World War II was here, that's what we relied on was God. Right, exactly. And now we're going to try changing it? Yeah. No, that's wrong. Yeah, the evolution, Jim, that's taken place has just kind of thrown us upside down. Just upside down, you know. So, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for all of our leadership. The Bible says to pray for our leaders. And so, Lord, we disagree. We do disagree. And, Father, I was thinking there was going to be uh, some um, proposals for an amicable separation. And I love some of the comments some of uh, my brothers and sisters shared here that if that took place, we should, as Christians, do it in a beautiful way. And we should not hold the line if somebody was wanting to pull out and say, you can't have the, your property, you can't have this, can't have that. Just in Christian love, let's, let's do it right. But Lord, the attention has not left, and it's still continuing to consume the church. And it'll be interesting the next four years to just see where we're going to go with the information that we have heard so far. So we just ask that you help us to be faithful, and above all, as we've said over and over again, to be faithful in love, to continue to try to remind those that we disagree strongly with that we do love them, we do care for them, we're praying for them, but this is, this is what we see, this is what we stand for, we stand on what we believe is the Word of God. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, and may all of God's people say, 
As we hear more, Don is so good about his connection there. As the more Don receives, feed it to us and I will feed it to you as well. I want us to look tonight for our discussion. And remember again, we're going to stop a few minutes before 7 because of the meetings that we have tonight. But I want to answer the questions uh, and start a, a discussion tonight on uh, restitution and the baptism of the Lord. So if you will look with me to the book of Acts to begin with, and remember again, we say this every week since we've been in the book of Acts, uh, we're in Acts chapter 2, um, that the Acts is the actions of the apostles, the early church is forming. We thought this would be a great time for us to be studying the early church and the principles of Christianity that were formative in those years as we are forming ourselves uh, as a church of Jesus Christ in this day and age. I don't know if there's a big difference between the crazy culture of Paul's day, especially in, in Athens, you know, and in Rome, and, and the crazy culture that we live in today. So I'm sure there's tremendous good advice. Well, where we left off um, last week, and remember again, as we're, as we're looking at this, uh, we're doing it as in-depth as we can with this many people. Um, plus, we, you know, we all have various backgrounds. We have various understandings of the Scriptures. Uh, some of folks are brand new in their faith. Others have been a part of the faith for many, many years. So some of us have heard these stories over and over again, grew up in Sunday school, Bible studies, sermons. Others, it's, it's fresh. And it's like, wow, I just never heard that or I never thought about that. So we have to kind of, I don't want to say generically, but we're throwing out some of these topics. And it's okay when you leave if you're like scratching your head saying, well, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to get that together in my head. It's, it's, we just need to work with that, you know. And, and that's why we pass the microphone around to see if we can answer any questions. Last week, if you were here, uh, Don and Ray shared a little bit about Pentecost for them. Now, remember, the church started at Pentecost. Pentecost is a Jewish uh, holy day, uh, and we talked about how that came about last time, if you were here, and all the people are gathered in that holy day, and the Spirit of God falls in a precious way, and the church is formed. And so we wanted to know people to share when the church of God's Spirit formed in their life. So Don gave a beautiful testimony. Ray gave a beautiful testimony. Both their testimonies, even though they were very different, even mine that shared last week, uh, were more emotional, more uh, aggressive, more uh, probably old-fashioned uh, Methodist Pentecostal style. But I have been with many sisters and brothers that have been filled with the Holy Spirit in a very uh, solitude and in quietness. And remember, even John Wesley said himself, my heart was strangely warmed, warmed you know, in his description. And I do believe with all my heart, being Methodist, that what the true sign of being filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit, we call it the Holy Ghost, is the assurance that passes all understanding. You know that you know that you know. That's what Mr. Wesley seemed to talk about at his, what he calls his Aldersgate experience. He knew that he was saved. Some people seem to get that right off the bat. My mama got that right off the bat. Daddy, it took him a long time. You know, Daddy needed a couple punches, you know, to, to work with him in his life. So, uh, and then, you know, most people, when they're running far away from God, when God does get a hold of them or they actually let God in, boy, they're running hard this way, you know? And it, it just, it's interesting to see that and the power of God. Others that are just kind of just, many of you are like that, I'm sure, you know, you've grown up being a fairly good person and maybe going to church or whatever, and you've just slowly morphed into Christianity. Well, the Spirit of God, once you have Christ in you, is there. But to activate that, you know, again, using the terminology of a second work of grace, Pentecost, baptism of the Spirit, I mean, just whatever you want to call that, it does happen at the moment of your relationship with Christ, but many times that's ongoing for years. It's an ongoing sanctification process. You know, you're growing in the Lord. I love the analogy I saw a, a fellow share one time. I've shared that with you before about, he said, it's like this, for those of you that are relatively new, he said, where he says, 
when I ask Christ to come into my life, I'm still sitting on the throne and Christ is in my life. He said, but when I truly let him be the Lord of my life, and he said that to me was the baptism of the Spirit, a second work of grace. And again, a lot of people say this happens at the very moment of salvation where the Spirit comes in. But he said in his description, I finally was able to get off the throne and Jesus sat on the throne and now I'm in my life, but Jesus is driving. He's not my co-pilot, he is my pilot. So that was just, I thought, a very uh, good layman's way of explaining Pentecost in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? Well, I want you to look at Acts chapter 2, because as soon as that happened, Peter preached an incredible sermon, and then after the sermon, something happened. Verse 37, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, I want to read verse 37 through 41, and then just talk about repentance and baptism of the Lord. Start with verse 37. When the people heard this, Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Every preacher likes to hear that. You know, what shall we do? Peter replied, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what we've been talking about. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Oh, my goodness gracious. Isn't that amazing? Word of God for the people of God. Now, there's so much there, but let's just just talk to begin with to answer the questions. Do you have to repent to be saved? Now, a simple way of understanding repentance, again, is a change of direction. And in my simplistic sermons, it's the idea of selfishness turning to selflessness, turning to Christ. You know, like the cross is up there, you know, I'm living my life this way, and now I turn to the cross. Jesus said you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, which is dying to your selfishness, and follow me, becoming a disciple. Now, there's probably no doubt that we need to repent to do that. That's what salvation is. But what about restitution? What about giving back? Think about Matthew, Levi, Levi Matthew, the tax collector, where he's sitting with Jesus, and uh, when Jesus is talking to him, and I picture that in my mind, just Jesus having fried chicken, you know, just sitting there and having a good old time with him, and, and he's cut to the heart, Matthew is, because he's cheated people, it appears, you know, I'm sure he, all the tax collectors did, they could take advantage of people, and he begins to say to Jesus, if I've done this, if I've done this, I'll pay back, and it's all, there's a rule set, you know, in the, uh, in the Old Testament of what they should pay back, or in the, uh, uh, the commentaries there of their day, you know, and he's going to do, he's going to pay it back, you know, and I picture Jesus pulling drumstick out of his mouth, <laughs> you know, and just chuckling, and, and his comment that's in the scriptures, his comment is, today, salvation has come to this house. Because the man is talking about the restitution that he's going to do. He is so convicted of what he's done wrong that instead of just saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, now I don't have to worry a thing about it. It's like, if I've done wrong, I'm going to make it right. Restitution. Is that something that is mandated in Christianity. Now, there's no doubt in the Old Testament it's mandated. I mean, there's so many passages, you, you know. Just use the one, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, and those, those rituals, you know, really were good laws to keep you from murdering. Let me say it that way, you know. I mean, it sounds very strong for us, you know, an eye for an eye. But really, the concept is that if I attack you and, and hurt your eye, damage your eye, then that person has the, the opportunity and the right to legally go after my eye. But he doesn't have the right to go after my life or my wife or my children. You see what I mean? It really is some safeguards in some rules and regulations. Those, that's fantastic in, in that light. So restitution was definitely in the Old Testament. Like I said, we can go many different stories there. But what about Jesus? Let me lift up a few 
passages I found in my study and then just open it up and see what your thoughts are, okay? Romans uh, 13, if you want to turn to that for just a minute. Romans 13, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. This is Paul's teaching about our relationship with the government. Chapter 13, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Paul says, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. I didn't want to hear that, did you? (laughs) If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt, verse 8, remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law, the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. Whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Wow. You know. Forgiving one another's debts. Let me give another one, and then we'll just see if there's discussion. Matthew 18. Don't turn to that one. I'm just mentioning it. Matthew uh, 18 is the parable of the unmerciful servant, where you have the, uh, the, the man owes millions of dollars, and he, you all remember that, and he can't do it. The guy's going to get rid of him, but he begs for mercy, and so... The boss man just forgives him. Remember? So then he turns and goes to a guy who owes him a few dollars. Remember, he owed millions, a few dollars. And he says, pay up or I'm going to put you in jail. Just like, I mean, it's the same scenario. And so the guy falls down and begs him. And you would think (laughs) that he would be forgiving, wouldn't you? Uh, you But instead, he throws him into prison. And the word gets back to the head honcho that the guy that you forgave those millions has thrown a guy in jail who owed him a couple dollars. And so he pulls him before him and he said, thou worthless servant, you know, you are going to be put away because of what you've done. Not because you owe me the millions, but because of the way you have treated others, you know. Same concept in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. Or forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. Any thoughts on that, on restitution? Anybody? What do you think? There you go. There's got Beverly right in the back back there. Well, I think I've said before that I used to go to AA meetings with my daughter. Now, AA teaches that if you have stolen money to buy alcohol or drugs, right. that... Uh, you should pay it back if you want to stay sober. And I heard one man give his testimony that it took him 20 years, but he paid back the Praise money God. that he had either borrowed or stolen. So, exactly. Uh, exactly. I think it's, uh, myself personally, I think if you owed somebody something that you should pay it back. Unless I, my daughter owed her dad and I money, we forgave her, you know. Yes. So you could do that too. But I think it's a good idea to pay okay. back. Hold on. And it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, testimony to pay yes. back. Yes, yeah. Hold on, Be- Beverly. Hold on to the mic for a minute. Let me put you on the spot. Now, I, I wouldn't do this to everybody, but I don't mind doing it to you, Bev. I love you. Uh, what's your concept, though? I mean, just what you said. I love the way you said it. It's a good idea. But do you think... does? Does God mandate that to us? No, to, I don't think he does. Okay. But I think if you want to be a good witness, yes. I mean, if you owed somebody money and you say, oh, I'm this wonderful Christian now, so tra-la-la, you know, <laughs> I don't think they would be so very long, happy so for, you know, for you not paying them back. I got you. I got you. Good. I love the way you described that. Anyone else? Different view, maybe? No? Don. Don does. Or go to there. Yeah, Brad? Well... I, I think she's correct. Okay. Okay. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had. She's a woman too. She's a oh, oh Brad, you're so kind. <laughs> I got a question about the three thousand here, and uh, that we talked about earlier. That oh, that got bat- saved. Ba- baptized, baptized and three thousand. Yes. Now let me ask you a question, Pastor. 
they did not have microphones back in those days. They did not have speakers. They did not have this. They did not have that. And 3,000 committed, okay? And then they baptized 3,000. Have you ever baptized 3,000 at one time? <laughs> <laughs> now, see, you're jumping the gun. We haven't got to the baptism part yet. Chances are it would have been incredibly difficult to baptize 3,000 folks. And so the mode of baptism would have been very, very important. Not only the words that you use for the time, but also Don Chapman had one and then over to, to Steve. Do Don first, Fran. He wanted Don. Don right there. Uh, hold on, Don, for just a minute. Um, 3,000 would be very, very difficult to baptize in one day. But the Scriptures does say a day with the Lord's like a thousand years and a thousand years. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. I'm looking at uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. It talks about there, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I've heard that as a child <laughs> yes. in messages, uh, that before you would go to the table, that if you had someone that you had done wrong to, that you would go to them and go ask make forgiveness it right. first. Yeah. Well, remember in the Sermon on the Mount as well, Don, uh, the concept there that if you are bringing your gift to the altar, and that's what you're referring to as well, that you ought to go to that person and make it right and then come back and offer that gift. So that is a strong teaching with what, what Beverly was saying and Brad saying as well that's in there. Even though the forgiveness is, an, is, an, is you are forgiven, but if the Holy Spirit is in you, there seems to be rules and regulations, directions that we should be following, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Who's there? Steve? Steve and then uh, Ray up there. Go ahead, Steve. I would say that repentance requires restitution. It's a making right of mm -hmm. what you've done wrong. And that's, that's part of saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what yes. I did. I want to restore the person that I have wronged. Right. You know, because sometimes our wrongs are simply against God, but sometimes our wrongs against God and other people. Exactly. And if we don't, you know, right the wrong done to the person, you know, simply saying, God, I'm sorry, really hasn't, you know, ultimately changed the situation. Um, you know, we have the story in the Bible of Zacchaeus, mm -hmm. who was a tax collector, and, and tax collectors were notorious for overcharging people uh, and, you know, lining their own pockets, filling their own pockets. Uh, and Zacchaeus promised restoration, exactly. restitution to all that he had wronged. And exactly. Jesus said, today salvation has, has come, come to, to this, this house. house. Exactly, Steve. Excellent, excellent. Zacchaeus is the tax collector. Levi was a tax collector as well, but the passage, Steve is right, is from Zacchaeus. And again, I think it goes with what Brad is saying and what uh, Steve is saying. You know, I think that we, I know I do sometimes. In sermons, you know, you give the concept of just repentance, just being turning to God. And yet, Steve, I like that description that there's, there, it's, there's an activity involved. If it's real, you know, and kind of go back, Beverly, what you said, you know, not just that it's a good thing to do. There just, there's a realness in if I have offended someone because of what you said about, you know, at the altar to go to them, I wonder if we negate, you know, God in our heart if we don't follow suit. That, that would be dangerous. Ray, let's go Ray first and then up there. Ray? You just, you just broke my thumb, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're repenting and you turn around mm -hmm. and you, like you said, you can't uh, commit until you make the commitment right with the other. Yes. So when you commit to him, you also commit to doing what's necessary to, to, it's, that's to part solve of the, the commitment. problem. Okay, that ties in just what they're saying, Ray. So maybe that's the idea of you must deny yourself, pick up your cross. And I've heard it taught that, again, the cross is dying to your selfishness. The idea then is I'm being a disciple. I have died to my worth of the idea that, that I am worthy and so, therefore, I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away, but if living as a disciple, I need to make it right. Just need to make it right. I know there's somebody right, oh, right there. Adele? You know, something I think, too, is not only the restitution part, and a bigger part of restitution 
is to be able to go to someone and ask their forgiveness. Yes. Because to me, if someone did me wrong, rather than you know doing something to make me feel better, the biggest thing they could do is come and say, I'm sorry. Exactly. And please forgive me. Right. And I think that's the same, same thing that the Lord wants. I think so. I think so very much, Adele. And I think our attitude needs to be right. And if we're not ready for that, in other words, if you're going to go to that person, if you're still right in the midst of the anger and you're just afraid if you don't get it verbally said, you're going to go to hell and you just go to them and say, I don't know what I did wrong, but I obviously did something wrong and I'm sorry. That probably isn't, isn't what's going to work. So we need to spend more time on our knees under the grace of God. But the intention is we're going to get to them and talk to them about what we've done wrong. Somebody else. Oh, Doc. I, I think the thief on the cross is the perfect example mm. that we don't have to make restitution because he didn't yeah. have an opportunity. That's, that's a good point. But that's theologically I, I know speaking. as a Christian, I like all through my life, the Lord will every once in a while lay something on my heart that happened so long ago, and yet it's like, okay, I need to do something about this now. Yeah. And I know that's true of other people because... I've had it done to me right. that somebody else wronged me. And they came to me many years, 50 years later. Yes. And uh, so I, I, I think that the Lord really does lay things on your heart. And when he does, you better do something about exactly. it. Exactly. Don, I had a, a man in my first church come to me. I think I've mentioned this story before when I had uh, asked him to step down from teaching a Sunday school class. And I actually moved him to doing a midweek Bible study. And it seemed to be fine. Um, and a year later, after church one Sunday, something moved in the worship service. He came up and gave me a bear hug, and he said, I'm so sorry, Pastor. And I, I, I was like, God bless you. I mean, you know, you know how those things catch you off guard sometimes? And he said, all this time I felt that you were trying to manipulate me, to hurt me, to remove me from one class and move me to another. He said, and I finally realized that that was not the intent. So I don't know what was said or what was done that made him come through that, but he had kept that to himself all that time. And I know that we all do that to some degree, like you're saying. We need to, and if there's anybody here tonight that you're just keeping something, take this as a word from the Lord tonight that maybe God is trying to get you to go to that person and, and make it right. And every time I say something like this, there's always somebody in the crowd that hasn't talked to a sibling in 30 years. And, and they just feel guilty, and then they're running on the phone, and it gets worse. D pray about it first. Maybe you did do what you needed to do 30 years ago, and maybe God wanted you to brush the sand off your shoes, and you did, and you don't need to go back there. So just make sure. Let the Holy Spirit we're talking about tonight give you guidance. I saw a... Yeah, Me. Sherry. Two things. Uh, first, years ago when Dr. Tom Farmer came for a revival when we were at the other church, and one of the things that stuck with me that he said one of his nights was that, that you're not even supposed to come to the altar and take Holy Communion if you hold something against someone. He says, you leave yeah. it and you go take care of it, whether it's personally that you do it or write a letter or, you know, that you do spiritual forgiveness somehow or another you have to uh forgive before you can even come whole to the table yes and you know and and that's a command and to uh, answer brad's question i heard on the radio this morning from one of the uh christian comedians and she said that in the nazarene church that they're all dunked but she went to a church in california and the pastor had a squirt pistol and he squirted people and he said anybody else and <laughs> so <laughs> that's how you would do 3,000. <laughs> well, we're going to jump into baptism here in a minute. This may take a, a couple weeks' topics on that. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah, Jerry. Oh. I was just rereading that. And could it mean baptism in the Holy Spirit and not in the literal sense we're talking about? Maybe. Maybe that's good. That's good. Actually, let's jump into the baptism passage there. If you look at the scriptures again, uh, and let's just, there's so many things about baptism. And you know, um, I have this incredible article from Steve. Steve, I read it today. Uh, that was fantastic. We, we won't get into this tonight, but it is a powerful article about the passage of Scripture about baptizing the dead. And that is in the Scriptures. 
And uh, the Mormon church holds to that. And Steve has written an incredible article that has been published, uh, Pastor Steve, that uh, is so insightful about that. And I just want you to know that we want to talk about that in the future, Steve. I, I just think that was absolutely amazing, your concept of the Old Testament and what that means about the resurrection. But there's so many aspects of baptism, you know, um, in the, these discussions we've talked about, the Methodist church baptizes three ways. Uh, the fourth way may be coming, Sherry, I don't know, but the squirt gun, you know. Uh, I know down here in Florida with all the, you know, you go to these theme parks and they have those big fans blowing with the water in them. Maybe that's what we ought to put out in the narthex and we just baptize everybody as they come in, you know. I don't know. But I was looking through the discipline and the doctrinal statements uh, rehearsing this and I'm having trouble finding where it teaches the three different modes of baptism. And I thought, Lord, now where is this coming from? I know, I know that we have, uh, I'll have to go back and look at Wesley's original sermons, I guess. But um, I, the little green book that comes from the Methodist Church, Methodist publication that we give out to all new members, describes the three modes of baptism, you know. And I've always been taught that. Um, I, I know that the, uh, I think the Didache lifts up one of the ancient writing of the different modes of baptism, I think. Um, but what is, and I know it's different churches have different understandings of this, but the one that we want to dig into tonight, at least start tonight, is what do you say when you baptize? And some churches really struggle with this concept, and, and they have formed other denominations in that process, you know, or at least that's part of their, of their structure Um, look, and this may be something you've never even thought about or caught, but I think it's very important to look at again. So if you'll look back at the same passage that we were looking at, go back to Acts chapter 2, and let's just begin there where he says in verse 38, Peter replied when they said, what must we do? Peter said, repent, and we talked about repent and restitution, great discussion on that tonight, and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, all right? So is that the proper words to say, in the name of Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to look at a few more. Let's go back to the Gospels first. Mark 16, 16. That's an interesting one. Now, if you were here Sunday, we talked a little bit about the snake handlers, This is where this one comes from, but this just happens to be in that passage. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So right there you'd think you have to be baptized. Jerry was saying, could these kind of passages refer to baptism of the Holy Spirit? Could, metaphorically speaking. But most people take this as a literal interpretation, this passage. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So you would assume that the concept there you would assume that what it means would be whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned, but it doesn't say that. It just says whoever is not, whoever does not believe is condemned. So the concept of do you have to be water baptized in this name, and the thief on the cross, as far as we know, was not baptized, you know, it's, it, at least we have no passage that would show that, that the importance of what we're discussing may not be the most important thing in the world. But I think it's vital in our study of the Scriptures to know what the Lord's desire is, okay? So, bear with me for a minute. Let's go back to the book of uh, Acts, chapter 8, verse 16. I'm just going to give you a couple quick ones. We're probably going to have to wrap up here in just a minute, but it'll be a good discussion going into next week. Acts chapter 8, verse 16. 
Back up with verse 15. Peter and John have just got there. Verse 15 says, When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. All right? Thumb over to chapter 10. Verse 48, remember now, these are just the early church forming. Back up one verse again. Peter says, verse 47, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. Verse 48, So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. And then one more, Acts 19, verse 5. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. I mean, remember, all these stories are the movements of the early church and people being filled with the Spirit and the church growing, and they baptized them, just like the uh, Ethiopian. Uh, with the uh, deacon Philip, you know, when they were experienced Christ, filled with the Spirit, they were baptized, you know. But every one of these passages says baptized in the name of Jesus. It does not say in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we say today. Dot. Let's go to Dot and then Ray. Fran, if you can do it. We've got five minutes. Go ahead. D- dot. The scriptures that we've been reading are, yes, the early church, but Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Why didn't Paul listen? (laughs) What you got, Ray? (laughs) <laughs> Paul wasn't married, was he? Oh, my goodness gracious. Go ahead, Ray. Uh, to me, it's uh, the baptism part is the celebration of the congregation. You have to be baptized. You know, you, you have the Spirit in you. Right. It's an inward admission and an outward action. Outward sign. Okay. So that outward action lets the people know that you are exactly. engaged. Exactly. Exactly. Could we compare it to um, stop in the name of the law? I mean, do I have to say in the name of the law, or is it just a principle? Is is it possible that the early church, as Dot was sharing, that the focus again on Christ is just that the concept is, it's obviously in the name of Jesus Christ, but the mode of baptism was still evolving, and then when they remembered, I guess, what Jesus had actually said. John, what's your thoughts? Well, my thought is, um, I know John the Baptist was baptizing with water, and he baptized Jesus with water. But why is it necessary for us to use water now? Yeah, there is a dry baptism by some concepts, exactly. Uh, With the movement of the church, I think because... The church interpretation is, at least in the Protestant movement, two sacraments or two mandates. One is Holy Communion. Why do we do that? Because Jesus said, do this. And why do we baptize with water? As you said, Dot said, Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we know that he was referring to to water baptism at that concept there. Yes, Adele? You know, one thing you have to think about, baptism is more or less a ceremony. Mm-hmm. baptism on its own does not work faith is what saves not baptism exactly and the methodist tradition you know we do not rebaptize. now we were given a number of years ago the opportunity to use the water and do renewal of baptisms and one of the motivating factors for that was because so many in the methodist church were christened many of you probably were i was and you were then going to be baptized later on in life, and so they changed, theologically speaking, the christening 
liturgy to be baptism for infants because it sounded in the old days in the Methodist church to Baptists. May I use that? Not being critical of the Baptist church, but to Baptists in the concept of dedication. And they wanted, because you're using the symbol of water for it to be actual baptism, and a child of age is confirmed into the church where they make their commitment to Jesus Christ when they're of the mindset. Don? Then Jerry? Then we're going to have our closing prayer, and then we'll kick off with this baptism. I've got an opening question for next week. The symbolism of water started, in my opinion, with the flood. Hmm. The flood cleansed the earth of sin. Right. And they had a chance to start new. Yes. Jesus was buried in water, and he came up actually in newness of life because he received the Holy Spirit. And the methodology or the words used when I was baptized was you die with Christ in the water and you're raised in newness of life. Yes. And let me mention to that, uh, that's in Steve's article. Let me mention, Steve, let me see if I can get this right. What's interesting about that too, and Jerry, and that'll be our closing comment for tonight. That's from Romans 6, and that's the concept that we've all used so many times, all denominations, about the dying and the resurrection. And we use the passage from Noah, just like we do with Moses as well. There's a passage with Moses. But in that concept, if you think about it, and that's what we're going to get into next week, uh, the different uh, understandings of baptism. I found one that I'd never seen before in my own studies about uh, Jesus. And let me say this real quickly, being baptized by John in the Jordan that we mentioned a moment ago. If that's a concept of starting the priesthood, then you have to look at what did they do in the Old Testament to anoint those early priests, and you'll find that fascinating. There was no immersion in the anointing of the early priests, but there was a sprinkling process. And when we talk about the baptism of Noah in the flood, the water came from up here, most of it. I know that they believe that the, the belly of the earth emptied up as well. I mean, we don't, it, obviously all kinds of things happen, uh, but they didn't go completely. They were not submarine style. Uh, so, but I mean, if you emphasize that more than anything, probably we ought to be taking pictures of water and pouring on like Noah's day. We just pour on like a cloud there. So is the mode of baptism and I'm going to have to research this week again to find out where in the discipline. I, I looked all through that, and I thought, I had to read that thing in seminary. It was the most, I've told you, boring book I've ever read in my life. Gosh, just trying to read that. And, uh, but looking through the doctrinal statements again and the United Brethren doctrinal statements, um, I'll have to do some more research on that. But that'll be a lively discussion next week, the mode of baptism, and maybe bring you your squirt guns uh, is an idea. Jerry, give us our closing comment. Well, mine was more simplistic than Don's. I didn't go in the dying and then resurrection. But it was just that the symbolism of washing away our sins. Yes, yes. Is that not yeah, exactly, exactly. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that are gathered tonight. What a lively discussion as we search deep into your word. Father, we are trying to understand your concepts understand your will, your direction in life. So we pray for wisdom and discernment. Guide us now as we go into our different meetings and especially our administrative board meeting in just a few moments. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. And may all of God's people say...